All right, well, we are ready to start another organic lab. So we're gonna switch our safety gear from the, this video is so 2020 with COVID-19. Take off my face mask and replace with the safety goggles. Because again, when we're gonna be heating something and we're dealing with glassware, the last thing we wanna do is damage our eyes. Um, I've looked at the safety data sheets for these compounds and nothing's dangerous enough that I would need gloves for or any of that. And so let's get into the lab itself. Um, this is another purification technique that is really excellent for organic chemists and even just regular people sometimes. If you wanna make rock candy, you can recrystallize sucrose and have some really great sweet rock candy. Um, I'll show you the technique for recrystallization. In general, what we're gonna do is we're gonna take uh, what we think is a contaminated sample. So this, somebody has somehow gotten some urea into our salicylic acid. So we believe this is a contaminated sample of urea and salicylic acid. This is right on the bottle, contaminated with urea. So we wanna purify it to make sure we have pure salicylic acid for our cosmetic products. You know, some people exfoliate with salicylic acid and so it's good to have that available for us. Um, we're gonna do a couple of things. We wanna take a melting point of our initial mixture to see how contaminated it is. If you remember from the melting point lab, a pure compound has a reproducible sharp melting point, which would indicate that we have good purity. A lot of times you can look at a sample and see if there's really nice crystals, they're probably pure. This one is all powdery. So this one doesn't look like the most pure sample. It looks like it's, it, it could be pure. Sometimes powders are pure. Crystals are almost definitely pure. So we're gonna take a initial melting point of our mixture to see how different the melting point is from the melting point of the pure substance. And that'll allow us a little diagnostic because after we recrystallize the sample, we'll be able to take a new melting point and see if it's improved, see if it hits the literature value. So what I've done is I've taken some of the mixture and put it in a capillary. Um, since you guys hopefully have done that already yourselves, it's not magic, but this is one of my favorite parts of the melting point determination. We wanna make sure that stuff is packed in there really well. So we use this tube and we drop the capillary in there. And for a piece of glass, this stuff is amazing. It bounces like it's made of rubber. And each time it hits, it packs the compound in a little better. So I just love seeing this thing bounce. And so I'm going to make it bounce a few times and really pack that mixture in there so we can get a good melting point. And if you haven't seen this yet, this is really cool. We use a capillary, which is a very thin glass tube. And relative to the size of the capillary, the walls are pretty thick for this. Um, small piece of glass, we don't wanna put any lateral pressure on this, but as far as just bouncing, this stuff is pretty awesome. The glass is pretty sturdy stuff. Um, so this is our capillary with the mixture in there. And then we're gonna load it into the melting point determination guy, the melt temp apparatus. And now I have a little window where if I look in there right, I can see the compound. Um, yep, nice white powder all in the capillary right in the window and about two to three millimeters of compound. We have some instructions for the melt temp and it gives us sort of target temperatures at different settings. If this is pure, it should melt at 158 degrees Celsius, 156 to 158. If I go to setting 3.3, I'll go 141 degrees, not quite enough. 4.2 will tap out at 184. So I want a setting between 3.3 and 4.2. So I'll dial it up to about 3.6. Now we've got some heat in here. And this is a lot like a distillation or something else where there's a waiting period for things to heat up. We don't want to be inattentive because if this thing melts when we're not looking, we lose the data. So one of the first things I'm doing is setting the melt, melting point capillary in the device with the compound in there. I've set this to what I think is an appropriate heating rate so that it'll melt it at a reasonably slow pace. And then we've also got our little temperature reader. And this is really great to have. I mean. We used to have a thermometer in there. The big digital readout makes this really straightforward and simple. 
You can see the temperature is increasing at a pretty good rate. 32.5, 32.7, 32.9, 33.1. Um, it's still nowhere near the 150 degrees that we're looking at. But remember, if this stuff is pure, it'll melt at 156 to 158 degrees. If it's impure, it might melt at a much lower temperature, so maybe even 110. So that's why as this thing gets up above room temperature, we are going to take a look at it pretty regularly because we're going to measure our melting range. As soon as we see any liquid in the sample at all, if any of it's melted, that's our initial melting temperature. And then when every last crystal is gone and it's completely melted, then we're going to take the final end of the range. So between when we first see melting and when it's totally done, that's our melting range. And if it's impure, then some of it starts to melt and then others take a longer time, so we end up with a broad melting range. If it's pure, it should all melt at the same temperature, so we have a nice sharp range. We're up to 43 and a half degrees now, so we started, uh, room temperature was about 27. So it's coming up pretty quickly. Again, I don't expect to see anything exciting until we get to at least 100 and probably more likely 120, but I don't want to get caught off guard, so I'm going to keep an eye on this. That's where the diligence and persistence is really important for, for us to have with this. Make sure we get no surprises in the lab except happy new, new discoveries. Some of the other things that I've done to get prepared for this is I set, I weighed out 0 0.5012 grams of the mixture. So we're going to see how much of it we can recover. If we got 100% of it back, we'd have 0 0.5012 grams back. We're probably going to get less than that because we're going to remove the urea. So we're going to lose some of the mass due to removal of the contaminant. So that's really good. We sort of don't want to get 100% back if it's impure because then it'll still be impure. And um, we're hoping if it's about 80% salicylic acid, we'll get 80% back as a totally pure compound. Inevitably, when we dissolve this up and recrystallize it, some of the salicylic acid is gonna stay in the water solvent. So that's gonna mean we're gonna lose a little bit when we do the recrystallization, but it's a price we have to pay to get the impure, improved purity. All right, so this, yeah, and it's probably only been a minute or two that this has been going. It's up to 60 degrees, and it seems like it's dragging on forever because I want to get to some of the more exciting parts. But patience is a virtue, so I'll continue to pay attention to the temperature and see if any of this is melting. Now, if I was working with a partner, what my partner might be doing for us is looking ahead at that we're going to need to filter this so we would maybe be setting up some uh, filtration apparatus and since this is only at 65 degrees I think I'm going to go get the uh, filter trap and hope it doesn't melt 67 degrees and still solid so looks like we do have a little flexibility with the time I'm going to go ahead and clamp this flask in and even though it might feel like this is clamped really well right now. Um, I feel more comfortable if it's actually sitting on the ground and clamped. So this is something that I'll try to do whenever I have a piece of glassware that I don't want to fly around and break. is to secure it really well, putting it on the ground and clamping it. We've got some vacuum hoses here, which are sturdier. They're a lot thicker than the ones we'd use for distillation. Again, keep an eye on this. Solid, all solid, and we're up to 73 degrees. So still probably nothing exciting till 100. These hoses, if they get a little twist in them, can really fly and flap around and put a lot of force on your glassware. So I wanna make sure when I'm dealing with these guys, I have things clamped in place or I hold them very firmly when I'm putting on the vacuum hoses. So what we're going to do is we're going to have vacuum trap here so that if any solution gets out of our filtration device, any liquid, it doesn't go into the vacuum and destroy the vacuum pump. It has a chance to fall into this trap flask and so the liquid will stay here and won't make it out to the vacuum pump. And when we get ready to do the filtration, 
we'll see that more in action. Again, we're up to 79 degrees. Another check, uh, no melting yet. So, and one of the things I also should know is the melting temperature of urea, because typically the mixture will melt maybe close to the melting point of the lower compound, but it's best to just pay attention to it experimentally, because sometimes a mixture will melt lower in temperature than either of the two compounds, and that is bizarre to me. I don't conceptually understand it, but that's what sometimes you see. So now we're at 83 degrees, still see nothing but solid. And just to make sure we keep this moving along, I'm going to give it another tenth on the setting up to about 3.7. I want it to be melting slowly when it melts, the temperature to be going up slowly when it melts. So I don't want to amp it up too much, but we don't want to spend the whole day reading off temperatures and looking at a solid. And I can talk through a little bit here. Um, the salicylic acid, the idea is we want to dissolve it and then re-precipitate it, recrystallize it as hopefully large pure crystals. So what we want to do is find conditions where it's very soluble so we can dissolve it all and then change the conditions so it's less soluble. And then when it's less soluble, it'll precipitate. So if you look at salicylic acid and look up data on it, only about one gram per 100 milliliters, very small amount, will dissolve in cold water. But if you heat it up close to boiling temperatures, then like 80 grams will dissolve. And so if we warm up, uh, and this water is the solvent, so the solubility data I was talking about was with water as a solvent. So if we take our salicylic acid and put it in water. It won't dissolve if it's cold, just a little bit will. But then if we warm it up, it'll dissolve. Now urea is very soluble in cold or warm water. So the idea is we can heat it up to dissolve the entire mixture. And then when we cool it down, the salicylic acid will re-precipitate as pure crystals and the urea will stay in solution. So that's the idea, is that we can change the solubility of the compound with changing the temperature. There's other ways to do it with solvent mixtures or evaporating off some of the solvent to change the amount that will dissolve. So you can imagine if you had dissolved in water and the water slowly evaporated, then as you got less and less water, it could dissolve less and less compound. Eventually, that compound would precipitate that way. So we want to take a solution where everything's dissolved and either remove some of the solvent or cool it off or something else so that one of the compounds will precipitate preferentially and then those crystals will be pure. All right, we're at the exciting 101 degrees and I'm looking very carefully. I do not see any signs of melting yet. I love seeing it melt and so that's one of the Maybe it's just you get so bored watching it not melt for 10 minutes that when it finally melts, it's super exciting. But just watching the little crystals melt away and form little drips of urea or salicylic acid. It looks like water, so I'm always tempted to say, ooh, look, a little drip of water. And we're up to 106 degrees, so cruising along nicely. The other thing that I'd warn you about is the uh, hot plate that we're going to use for heating things later it looks the same when it's hot and cold, so it's, uh, you don't want to touch it to find out if it's hot. Melting point for the pure substance is 156. And some people might think it's going to melt close to that, but sometimes the mixtures are way lower. That's why I'm going to pay really close attention to this. It almost looks like it's changed size in the gas. Larry. Oh yeah, it looks like it's starting to, starting to get going. I wish my eyes were better, but it looks like it's a little liquidy in there. We're only at 118 degrees, but it's getting a little more transparent in there. I can't tell if a little bit of it's melted or if it's changed solid form but it looks a little less white and opaque and a little more transparent. Thinking this might be a little dull to be looking at this compound and waiting for it to melt. 
I can only imagine what watching the video is like. A video of somebody watching a compound that's not melting. To 122, and again, it seems like the heating is not going quite as fast as it should right now, trying to get up to the 150, so I'm going to add another little tenth here, and it's a lot like cooking. If something isn't boiling when you think it should be, you can change the temperature up a little bit. All right, I definitely see liquid now, so onset of melting at 123.5, 123.5. Way less than 156. And right when I thought I was getting so bored I couldn't watch this anymore, if I had turned away I would have missed it. Make sure you write things down because you might think I'm going to remember 123.6 degrees Celsius forever and then two minutes later you might, what was it? 126? One, I don't remember. And actually, since I'm watching this carefully, I might have my partner take the data for me. Oh yeah, little crystals are just melting away, and I, I think sometimes the lower melting component will do, will melt and then dissolve the other one. So we're definitely uh, seeing some slow action here as things are melting, little drips are forming. Again, probably drips of melted urea dissolving the salicylic acid. Still solid in there. We're up to 128.4. So quite a broad range. If this was all pure, it would all melt within this, a degree or two. And this one's been going for about six degrees, and it's still not anywhere near all melted. Definitely some liquid in there. 131.7, so it's been an, it's almost a 10 degree range already. Clearly two compounds in here. One's dissolving and trying to One's melting and trying to dissolve the other one. We're up to 134.2. I probably should add the heat up a little higher, but it said that the setting of four would bring us to 184, and we did not want to be at 184 that quickly. Ideally, this would be done in about 10 to 15 minutes. We're up to 137. So from 123.6 up to 137, it's a very broad range. And pure compounds, melting points are sharp at a predictable temperature. If it's a mixture, it's gonna melt at a lower temperature and much broader. That's part of why we pack it in really well to start is because the more packed in it is, the better the heat transfer is across the crystals All right, it looks like we have melted at 141.4, 141.4, so an enormously broad range from 123.6 to 141.4. Now I'm gonna go ahead and reduce the temperature here, bring this back down, take the capillary out. Yeah, it's all melted. So this is a very impure sample and we're definitely gonna to wanna to recrystallize it. So now we can set the melt temp aside turn the temperature meter off, and proceed with the rest of the experiment. 